by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that God has made. So they are without excuse. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Everyone on the planet knows God exists. That's the truth. That's what this text tells us. People suppress the knowledge of the truth by their own unrighteousness. Now, here's the deal. I want to disarm, I want you guys to be aware of this. That this, that if you see something in the text of Ephesians, you have a visceral reaction. Like, okay, that makes sense. Why? Because it could come up. Just saying. This is not just in this text of Romans. 7 Thessalonians 2.10 to 12. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So it's not just about knowing the truth, it's about knowing the truth and loving the truth. Okay? Amen. Last one, 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They're spiritually discerned. Now, here's the reason why I want to point this out. Here's the reason why I'm like, hey, just because you hear the truth doesn't mean you're going to love the truth, and just because you hear the truth doesn't mean you're going to be fully like on board. Here's the reason. The backbone of most non-Christian worldviews is steeped, steeped, against the text of Ephesians that we're about to look at. It's steeped. Um, every other non-Christian worldview is steeped into some foundational presuppositions about the nature of man that we got to deal with first before we get to this text. This will make sense, I promise. So, check this out. Worldviews are made of these things. When we're looking at worldviews, this is what's really helpful. If you take a worldview as a whole, right, you break everything down to its smaller parts, right? Make sense? Worldviews are made of these networks of things called presuppositions. I want to give you a really good Definition of presuppositions are by a man that I consider one of my heroes, Dr. Greg Bonson. I wanted that on a t-shirt, but that, that, <laughs> they got those shirts, and I'm like, that's just weird. But check this out. I want to read this definition because this is really important. Bonson's definition. Presupposition is an elemental assumption, elementary assumption in one's reasoning or in the process by which opinions are formed. A presupposition is not just any assumption in an argument, but a personal commitment that is held in the most basic level of one's network of beliefs. Right? These things are foundational to people's worldviews. Presuppositions form a wide-ranging foundational perspective or starting point in terms of which everything else is interpreted and evaluated. As such, Presuppositions have the greatest authority in one's thinking, being treated as one's least negotiable beliefs, and being granted the highest immutability to re uh, revision, right? Here's the thing about presuppositions. Presuppositions are things that are caught, sometimes not taught. We, elemental things, we think about the world and how the world works, we catch and they're caught, means as we interact with culture and things like that, they, they come into our belief system, right? You don't even think about them. You just assume them to be true, and then you have foundational presuppositions, and until someone messes with those, so someone messes with those, you don't think about it. Does that make sense? So check this out. All worldviews. So this network of presupposition here, all worldviews must answer these following questions. Why is there something 
something rather than nothing. Right? This deals with origins of things. How did things come into existence? How did, uh, how did people get here? Who is man? Who is man? This is where we're going to be going today. To, to, to let the cat out of the bag early. I know. <laughs> we say the cat early. That makes sense. <laughs> Come on, I'm trying here. I can take lessons from safety. Yeah. So, who is man? Well, it seems like I can do it. I'm glad I was <laughs> Check this out. Who is man? What is the nature of man? What is man like? Those are questions the world needs to answer. What is going wrong with the world? This, uh, and to be honest with you, intrinsically, even non Christians know. That there is something really wrong with this world. Every worldview has a salvation story, in a sense. Something's wrong. Here's a savior to get something is wrong. Things are things are given a punishment is being incurred, like a hell or something like that. Here is a savior or answer to this problem, then go do it. Every worldview has that exact same meta-narrative, including secularism, which we'll see here in a moment. So, what is going on with the world? How do we fix what is wrong with the world? That's, that's the Savior thing that I just said. What is going to fix this problem? Every world you have to ask that question. And then finally, where is history headed? Where is history headed? What is the eschatological thing of where this whole boat, this, this bus is going? Every worldview has to answer these things. Now, let me be blunt and totally honest to the point. Every non-Christian worldview gets this wrong. Because every non-Christian worldview is inherently inconsistent. According to the text that we read in Romans 1, a little bit before that, we're made in the image of God, right? God made everything. Creation, he made man, he made male, female, that's it. Don't care what anyone else tells you. <coughs> now, here's the deal. God makes everything. So guess what? My non-Christian friend, we live in the exact same created world, and he's a created being just like I am. Right? Every other non-Christian world you has to steal from the Christian world. Come on. To make your worldview Come. make sense. Come on. It's like those flex seal commercials. You ever see those? Where the guy's like, I'm going to cut a bolt in half of the sun. Those things are crazy. <laughs> That's funny. Like, there's no way that product will work out. <laughs> I've seen it in full commercials. I've seen the setting for dead thing. I watched my aunt buy one and it never worked. <laughs> setting for oh yeah, the roaster thing, you're not putting anything in that. I'm just honest with you. It's going to get gross and dirty and you're going to throw away. What? <laughs> Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like flex seal. It's like there's a giant gaping hole in people's worldviews, and they have to slap. Like, oh. They slap the flex seal out of the world. You don't make it work. They have to steal from Christianity to make it work. Because they're. I'll give an example of this. Give an example of these handles on this thing. Atheists, right? A lot of them come on real hardcore, like, atheists. They have moral objections to God. I think that's hilarious, personally. Do you know why I think that's hilarious? According to their worldview, man is nothing more than a, than a highly evolved animal, like a chimpanzee with a, with, with a brain helmet like the Planet of the Apes. Transform it. I think man is nothing more than like highly evolved. I mean, I met some people, so. Um, point is, man is an animal in their world. Their worldview. Now, check this out. You guys ever watch Animal Planet? I know it's been a minute. Animal Planet is the most cool thing since I watched as a kid. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. I don't know why this lion's eating this gazelle, but it's awesome. That's <laughs> how it was. I had a really interesting childhood. Now. <laughs> Here's the thing. In their worldview, if a lion has territory with another lion, and lion A kills lion B, that's not a moral issue. That's what animals do. Here's the reason 
reason why I think my atheist buddy moral objection to God is funny. Because in his worldview, morality can't exist. It just can't. It just is what it is. This animal is doing what this animal does. How, according to, if the words according to what standard destroy your argument, pick a better argument. It's the truth. It's the truth. I think it's very interesting that, and, and another thing too, the reason why we think about this on a worldview level, this is extraordinarily powerful to think about apologetically, right? Because this way, when you're presenting Christianity to your non-Christian body, you know this, according to your own standards, your worldview is terrible. You, you just look at my worldview, you're doing an internal critique of their worldview, and then show them the consistency of Christianity. Make sense? Make sense. All right. Here's the reason I point this out, and this is very important. The truth of our text conflicts with every other non-Christian worldview other than biblical Christianity. I let this cat out of the bag a little bit earlier. Who is man? Who is man? This is anthropology 101. No, anthropology. Who is man? Our text talks about something that is in complete conflict with the world around us. So it, it breaks that who is man, and it has drastic implications on that other question of how do we fix what is wrong with the world, right? If you get one question wrong, you're going to get the next question wrong. It's like math. You guys ever do math? You love math? You want to hate math? A bunch of math haters. <laughs> Check this out. Like in math, if you get the problem wrong up here, you're going to get the problem wrong down here. It's just going to follow through. It's going to be like a cycle of wrong. It's going to be sad. You're going to get marked down. You're going to be sad. That's why. Not really. Some of the people are having flashbacks in high school. No matter. So, so check this out. Let's look at our text. Let's look at our text. All of this, all of this is to set this T up. So we can we can hit the tee, we, we can hit the, the golf. I don't play golf. I do really watch it. Like tee ball? Yeah, I was good with that. <laughs> I was big as a child, so it was more like I should have played football instead of baseball. Like I said, a weird child. But look at our text. And you were dead in the trespasses, and were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, mm -hmm. among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying around our desires in the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. Right? So this is our text. So I want to do a little bit of a case study. Remember I said non-Christian world use this, this is like this is like kryptonite. It just it butts up against it. They don't like this. I want to do a, I want to do a critique of a worldview. That way you guys know what I'm talking about. Does that make sense? Good. So, the first two questions. Who is man? What is, who is man? And then the second question, what is wrong, wrong with the world? This is a case study of secularism. Secularism. Atheistic, Darwinian, uh, secularism. This is taught in most, uh, this is taught in all government schools and is assumed by many in our culture. This is this is reflected in culture, society, in all throughout places. This is this is uh, it's reflected in government in different places like that. This worldview is.
very prolific, is what I'm trying to point out. Secularism believes man, this is the portion of the world, is basically good. Man is basically good. I think that's hilarious because those people clearly have never turned on news. Man is not basically good. If you watch any news program, news programs will be for anxiety. I'm just saying, think it will it's fall apart. In some aspects, it is. It's true. So check this out. They teach man is basically deprived rather than depraved. The reason there are problems in this world, right? They're answering the question, who is man? Well, man is, according to their worldview, man is basically good. It's just he doesn't have the things that he needs, and therefore, because he doesn't have the things that he needs, he acts in a bad way. This is one of their uh, secular psychologists, Carl Rogers, who's the founder of humanism, said this, I am... What I am is good enough if I would only be it a little Wow. So reflects that fundamental presupposition of the world view. Man is basically good. They use the analogy of a flower. You guys have been gardening? I would be close to the end of the season. I grew corn once. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. There was corn growing outside. <laughs> Somebody found that. <laughs>
They kill more people than the worst serial killers imaginable. I look this up. My accountability partner on my computer who gets every website I visit is going to be shot this week. I'm going to be looking up one serial one seriously. He's serial killer. Dude, I'm concerned. Uh, Louis Rivera was a Colombian serial killer who killed 300 people. Man, was a maniac. Infamous Ted Bundy killed 100 plus people. I read an LA Times article this week about an abortion doctor going through Texas right now. That in 60 hours, committed 50 abortions. Holy shit. In 60 hours, killed 50 people. All he does is make you dangerous apart from the finished work of Christ. Apart from having a Christian worldview, and apart from doing it for the glory of God, all education, technology, and all the other stuff does is make you dangerous. Like, think about the technological advancements we have right now that. That all it does is make people more efficient centered, like the phones and stuff we carry in our pockets. The prevalence of internet pornography, uh, sexuality, and stuff like that is just rampant in our culture. We just couldn't have been there 100 years ago. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Amen. That makes sense. Now, the outcome is all this does is make us more of an efficient center, more of the same stuff that's causing more of the same problems, right? Everything society does to fix the problem of who is man, what is wrong with the world, they get it wrong, and it makes the problem worse. Amen? Amen. Now, this idea of man being basically good, right, has influenced, this is the, this is the portion, this is the reason why I'm setting all of this up, this is important. This idea has influenced the church. Why? Because worldviews are caught, not taught. In some aspects, presuppositions are caught, not taught. So when you send your kid to school, movies, music, culture, all of these things say man is basically good. And worldviews become portions of assumptions, right? Does that make sense? Here's the reason also. Churches rarely, rarely challenge this or teach how utterly depraved man really is. We don't delve into how sinful humanity actually is. Because, to be honest with you, most people in our culture that claim the name of Christ are biblically illiterate. That's the truth. We don't understand the depths of sinful depravity. We don't understand, we don't get the questions right. Who is man? Man is a depraved sinner that needs a desperate need of a savior. How do we fix the problem? Preach the gospel. We, we get we we don't understand the depths of our own depravity. Does that make sense? That's the reason I'm railing on this, and that's the reason why I'm putting this up here, so that we might see this. And to be honest with you, people that are pastors don't tend to don't tend to challenge that because the average church here, average church service is a seven steps to a better you message, right? It assumes the presupposition that man's basically good. So let me give you seven tips to make, that make you better. Right? That's not my job. My job is to tell you the truth of Scripture, whether you like it or not. That's the truth of the matter. Now, this is why people get angry when they hear texts like ours today, which we'll, which we'll probe into more, because it assaults their presuppositions. Right? So here's the, here's the transition. If you're in, if you see something in this text that you get angry or apprehensive about, understand that you might have just uncovered a presupposition. Does that make sense? Because I've had people that I've talked to about this and the utter depravity of man. They're like, no, that's not right. It says it right here. I uncovered a presupposition. Does that make sense? I say all of that so that when we hear the word of scripture. We accept it and we love it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? I know that was a brown, kind of convoluted way to get to here. But let's look at our text. Let's do an old-fashioned Bible study in our text. So, this whole story of the Bible is that God makes man in his image and likeness, right? Our first parents, Adam and Eve, sin in the garden. And they eat of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Sin, and they utterly die spiritually. 
They do, in the day of the Eden, surely you will die, right? They die spiritually and then they die physically later, right? Makes sense. The whole storyline of the Bible. And you were dead in the trespasses, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and minds, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Ask a question here. What does it mean? What does being dead in sin mean? Right? There's two things. Should have made that better. Not that that. One, it is our condition before God. Our condition before God. The reformers used to use this phrase called total depravity. Total depravity. <coughs> sin has infected every part of your being so that you do not desire God. You do not desire the things of God as you ought to. Sin is so rampant within uh, that you cannot come to God apart from the grace of God, opening your eyes, which is the truth that we sung about moments ago. Translation, you're not basically good. You're basically sinful and basically evil. That's the truth. That's the truth. That's what's so offensive, right? Because you can pay someone 160 bucks an hour to sit down in a chair and tell you how awesome you are. That's the truth. That's not the picture the Bible paints of you. You're not a perfect little snowflake or flower. You are a depraved, wicked sinner who needs to repent and turn toward Christ by the grace of God, right? An example that I've used before and is a pretty famous example that sin doesn't say compartmentalized in certain areas is the drop of water, right? In the, the dog, who took a glass of water, right? I took some red dye, like, drop the red dye into the, into the water. Would it just sit there? No. It's not like a rock. You throw a rock into the rock, sitting on the bottom, it goes up. That's what they taught in volume in fifth grade science class. I remember it was paying attention. No, the, the drop of the drop of dye totally goes through the entire through the entire glass of water. Sin has so done that to us that our minds, our wills, our emotions, everything is steeped in sin. Sin affects everything of the individual, including our wills. Our wills are completely affected by sin, right? When it says people, uh, your sinners by nature, who are by nature children of wrath, people make choices and choose things according to their nature, right? If sinners, are, if people are by sinner, or sinners by nature and dead in their sin, they will not choose God on their own. It takes the grace of God to break through and make them see the glory and goodness of God. Hallelujah. Exactly the point here. Yeah. Exactly the point. People, like every decision you make is impacted by your nature. Like, give me an example. Pepsi or Coke? Pepsi? Coke? People like Coke. Like, you don't have to think about that. Filet mignon or... Cat. Cat. Uh, <laughs> I'm never living that one down. Just saying, that's. Oh man. Oh man. Stir fry. Stir fry. Stir fry. Stir fry. <laughs> Somebody said, please enjoy it. We love you. Not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. 
Choose things according to your nature, right? Your nature is inclined toward the stake, whereas your nature is inclined toward the stake over the crackers. Another example is for the lion and the bunny rabbit. But you had a head of lettuce, and I offered it to a lion. The lion's going to look at me laugh. <laughs> I don't want to eat that. If I give a bloody steak to a bunny rabbit, the bunny rabbit's going to run it higher over there. The lion's probably going to want to eat the bunny rabbit. That's just the truth of the matter. That's how it's going to go. But if I switch them and give them something according to their nature, they would love it, right? The lion would eat the steak and probably still want to eat me, but he'd eat the steak. The bunny rabbit would eat the lettuce and be satisfied for a time being. That's how we make decisions. That's how we make choices. We choose things. We're told depravity. We choose things based on our nature. Sinners choose to sin because their nature is sin. This affects salvation. This is reflected in salvation. In salvation, sin touches every part of our being, including our desires. We don't want God by nature. And that gets reflected in as you can see here, the prince of the power of the earth, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once <coughs> the passions of our flesh, carrying out our desires in the body and in the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, right? We're seeing that work itself out in the world around us. Now, I want to note here, the reason for the medium up there is we're not mostly dead and said, well, we're still the princess bride. <laughs> it's hilarious. Like, they bring the dude to the guy. Clearly, I haven't seen this in a minute. The dude to the guy. That's a terrible way to start, man. Right? So they bring the hero to this guy who's behind me. He's like, he's dead! And Billy Crystal's character said, no, he's not dead. He's just mostly dead. Which is, mostly dead is slightly alive. Slightly alive. Us in sin, we're completely dead in our sin. Completely dead, not wanting or desiring God. So this is our condition before God. And this is the precept of this is this is the foundational precept of Christianity. This makes this is this is massively important. So this is our condition before God, and this is the condition of the world. Remember we said who is man? How do we how do we fix what's wrong in the world? Well, this is the condition of the world around us. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived, the passions of our flesh, carrying on the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Right? This is where we were before Christ came and saved us. We're more sinful than we possibly could imagine. We're more sinful than we possibly could imagine. This is the reason what's messed up in the world. This is the reason the world is so jacked up. This is the reason the, the world is filled with sin and sinners. Right? I want us to get this so that, like, the people around us are following the prince of the power of the air. They're living in the passions of their flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. People are a slave to their own sin. The people you see on TV are not, look like they're having fun currently, but they're not. They're slave to their own desires. They can't stop if they want to. This may be explained to some of you. I don't know what your hearts are before God. I don't know what your heart is before God or where, where you act. Um, if you don't know Jesus, let today be the day of salvation. <laughs> let, this, might, this might actually, this ex, I explained this to a friend of mine who was talking to one of his non-Christian family members. And he was just astounded that I can't believe they do that. I can't believe they think that. I can't believe that this is what's going on. Like, yeah, people are totally depressed. The reason why you get shocked and awed on the news when you see something is because things are totally depraved. People are totally depraved. It's, it's shocking to see the level of depravity in society. Amen? Amen. Does that make sense? <laughs> that makes sense? I want to paint this clearly. Because what this does, this understanding the depravity of man, right? When we understand how bad man really is, it makes the grace of God show up greater, right? Like a con, like a contrast of things. Like, like if we painted this wall white, 
and then wrote in black letters on here. You would see that, right? We're doing a sign, a redesign of our sign out there with our new logo and stuff like that. We're in our elders meeting, and uh, Jim Dykley is like, I love it. You can see it at night. You can see it a mile away. Well, it's black on white. Of course you can see it. The contrast is there. You can see it six miles that way. Probably not six miles. That's probably six miles. <laughs> but you can see it at, at night because there's such a good contrast. That's the contrast between the depravity of man and the grace of God. This is where, this is what's lovely. Look with me in our text. Look with me in our text in verse 4. But God, Amen. but God, rich in mercy, Amen. because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised up with him, and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ, in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Can I see the contrast? Man is totally terrible. And God is totally good and gracious. The grace of God shows up when we understand how sinful man is, how sinful you are, how sinful I am. We see his grace more wonderfully, right? More like, you get more taste buds. You guys ever been really hungry and then eating something and it's just gracing the entire world? That's the contrast. That's the thing. When you understand the gravity of man, you understand that like, extra taste buds grow. Amen. So you can see and savor the goodness of God. Yeah. Right? So Paul makes it clear that we're saved by grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Hallelujah. If you merit it in any way or do anything to get it, it is no longer grace. Amen. It is not your own doing. Here's a contract, wages. You do what, you work a job, you get what you, you deserve, and you get paid. Yes. Grace, unmerited favor. You didn't do anything, you're getting blessed because God gives you something by His grace. We don't deserve heaven, we deserve hell. We deserve wrath and punishment. When yes. God, seeing our depraved, sinful, sick, broken condition, Gives us his grace. Lord. Right? And the byproduct is that we don't get to boast in it. We don't get to boast in anything except Christ. Hallelujah. Like, we're not awesome. Quote by Lady Jonathan Edwards. You contributed nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Mm. Uh, say that again. You contributed nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Everything you have in Christ is by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, for his glory alone. That's, the, that's what makes the gospel so awesome. It's because he offers wicked, depraved sinners life and renews them and gives us life in the doctrine of regeneration because of his grace. Amen? Does this make sense? This is why... Paul says, it's not a works list. Any man should boast. Not a works list. Anything you do, anything you do other than coming to God, it could be a work. I remember that I had a vivid illustration when I was 17. So I came, to, I came to faith in Christ. I asked my youth pastor. I thought this man was, he's a good man. I remember sitting down with him. I was like, Pastor Jeff, why did I come to faith? And my buddy over here, I shared the gospel with 14 times not. His answer was unfortunately wrong. He's like, you knew a good deal when you saw them. No. No. The thing that brought me to Christ was not because I'm awesome. Not because I saw a good deal and then went for it. The thing that brought me to God was the grace of God. If it was anything other than that, I could boast. I could boast in nothing. I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm not good enough, nothing. And here's the thing, neither are you. Amen. If you're in Christ, you only stand there because of the grace of God. 
Amen. 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 And that's the only thing we get to rely on, brothers and sisters. There's nothing else we can boast in. I did not choose Jesus. Jesus chose me. Amen. I wasn't looking for Jesus. Jesus was looking for me. I want to hammer that. Amen. That's incredibly important. Now, let's look at our text and tease some things out. What did the grace of God do for us? Well, it made us alive. We were dead in our sins. Dead in our sins and trespasses. The analogy is like, the analogy is not like the guy getting thrown a life preserver that gets thrown overboard. It's the dead guy on the bottom of, on the, bottom of the ocean. It's like Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. It's like not the guy that's almost dead, like we see in the meeting. He's almost dead, but no, he's really dead. He's so dead that it's a pile of bones. There's no possible life in this person, but God opens their eyes, gives them spiritual life, like Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. So Lazarus, come forth. He came forth because he gave him life. Does that make sense? You guys trying to line up in that? This is mission critical here. Like, we, he made us alive. The doctrine of regeneration. We went through the order of, the order of salutis a couple weeks ago. We were talking about how God foreordains and predestines us for this new life. This is one of the things that God opens our eyes by his grace and gives us spiritual life, taking out the heart of stone, giving the heart of flesh. It's all God. He raised us up with Christ. So he makes us alive. He raised us up with Christ. Check out our text again. That by grace you have been saved, raised up with him, and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the coming age might show us the measurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Brother and sister, if you're here today and you're burdened in Christ, this is the closest to hell you will ever be. It's only up from here. You one day will be seated with Christ in heaven, in glory, and it will be glorious. Yes, days will be hard. Yes, days will be difficult. But I want you to know the measurable riches of His grace. You only have to look forward to it. Because of this grace. That's why I preach grace to God. Because it's supposed to be, it's amazing. It's always saying amazing grace. Because it's amazing. Because I was a wretched, wicked, horrible, dirty, gross sinner, and God opened my eyes, not because I'm awesome and I suck, but because He's awesome and great and glorious. Raised us up with Christ. He saved us unto good works. Check this out. Check the tail end. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Good works are a byproduct of the Christian life. We don't earn God's favor oh, like our Catholic friends that do good works and never really feel like they've done enough. We do good works because God has given us grace. Yeah. It's the cart and the horse thing. The cart, the horse pulls the cart, not the cart pulls the horse. Like. God gives us his grace and gives us good works to do the Lord of for one another and for his kingdom. When we preach the gospel, when we serve one another, when we share Christ and we see people uh, come to faith, this is good. This is glorious. Amen? Amen. 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 We're saved unto good works, not by good works. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I know this is, this is pretty deep, stuff we went into today. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ. I don't know, your, I don't know the spiritual condition of everyone in here. Maybe to let today be the day of salvation. If you're feeling God press on you right now, that's, a, that's God showing you grace. Amen. That you might repent and know Christ as your Lord and Savior to turn away from your sin and turn toward the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who lived a perfect life, died a brutal death in your place and for your sins and will forgive you. Anyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. But today be the day of salvation. Maybe you're today and you're just discouraged. And had a hard week. A hard. Maybe you're going to have a hard week. Rest in the grace of God, brother and sister. Mm -hmm. Rest in his grace. 
It is neither high nor death nor angel nor principality nor things present nor things to come can ever separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's glory his name, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your gracious glory is in God. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for <coughs> living the life that was perfect, dying brutal death in our place and for our sins. It's in your name.